Uh, Miss Carol, thank you so much for traveling with Brother Robbie. Uh, being a preacher's wife, uh, unless you are one, you don't know. Uh, it's one of the most difficult things in the whole wide world. And, uh, and if you have him, <laughs> she's got to have a special unction uh, from the Lord. No, it, it, but it is very, very difficult, and she is a great godly lady. I'm so very thankful to have her with us tonight as well. Thank you, ma'am, uh, for traveling with Brother Robbie. And uh, it's just dear friends of the church and dear friends of uh, my dad, my mom, for all these years. And I'm just thankful he keeps coming uh, to Bethel Baptist Church. Amen. Amen. Uh, make sure uh, that you remember. Now, Saturday we have the preaching time is, is not going to be, but soul winning time is still going to be. We're still going to go out. 10, 30, 11 o'clock, we're still going to go out soul winning, okay? So I, I thought about that just as I said that. Oh, man, everybody's going to stay home. But uh, no, make sure you come out soul winning. We're on a streak now. We're, we're doing very well. Let's not stop now, amen? Uh, doing good, and folks are getting saved. Visitors coming every week, and make sure we keep doing what God's asked, to, uh, asked us to do, amen? All right, Brother Robbie, we're, we love you. We're thankful that you're here, and I'm so excited to have you. With, again, uh, runs all points and so many other things that he does with the chaplaincy of the military forces, and uh, I'm sure he'll tell you a little bit about that, but let's give him a great hand as he comes. Brother Robbie Morrison, should we love you? Well, we are excited to be back again this week. I Preacher thinks I'm, I come up with this saying, but I, I don't know where I heard it, but I told, told him one day, I said, I am living proof that God is hard up for help. <laughs> I'm living proof, amen. If God can use me, he can use anybody. Take your Bibles and find the book of Proverbs and go to Proverbs chapter 1. Uh, earlier this year, I got started in the book of Proverbs and I'm stuck, so you're going to have to put up with it, Amen. And so, got one amen. And uh, so, a couple things I'd like to do this week while we're here. And uh, years ago, I did this, and, and the Lord just impressed my heart. Last fall, we got back at it. If you go by the table back there in the, in the vestibule, you'll find this sheet of paper. Now, there'll be a new one tomorrow night and another one on Friday night I want you to get. And you'll see this. It says, All Points Baptist Worldwide Prayer List. And what I've done and, and updated, just had this years ago, they say there's 254 recognized nations and territories in the world today. That was the last official count I've got. So what it did is it took a 30-day period of time, divided those up to where if you pray for eight, sometimes nine, in a couple days, ten nations, you can pray around the world in 30 days. The Bible said this, what he said, Jesus looked at his disciples and he said, the harvest truly is great, but what? But then what did he say? Pray ye, therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. When's the last time you prayed that God send a missionary to Sri Lanka? To Liechtenstein which made me think, if you do me a favor, pray tonight for Pastor Steve Brown, his wife, Pam, Brother Steve Brown, pastors in Livonia, Michigan. His son is a missionary in Liechtenstein. And in the morning, they're going to do quadruple bypass on Miss Pam. Uh, they had stents put in just a few weeks ago, and the stents are plugged up tonight. And she's in Youngstown somewhere in the hospital. They were traveling. And so pray for that, but pray for laborers. Now, I'll say this, and I'm not even preaching it, but look at me. One of the reasons we don't pray is because we might be the answer to the prayer. Or worse than that, our kids might be the answer. Well, amen, praise the Lord. I haven't got started yet, amen. Don't clam up on me now. I'll come back there where you're at, amen. I feel better right now than I've felt in four years, so just buckle up, amen. amen. Put your seat back up. Put your trade table up. Buckle your seat belt. We're going to take off, amen. And ain't time to pray, amen. 
Here's the time to pray. Amen. Then I'll challenge you to do this. Get a list of your missionaries from your church that you support and write them beside the countries that they're in. So at least one time a month, you'd pray for your missionaries. So go by the table back there and get one of these. And uh, You say, does it work? Let me give you a, a testimony. My wife and I, I, I spent some time in Estonia several years ago. And we could not find one independent, fundamental, Bible-believing, Bible-preaching missionary in Estonia. And so we came back, my wife and I, and we were talking about that. We began to pray. A few years before that, we met a missionary and got to be friends with a guy named Mike Smith. Mike Smith went to Siberia. Got to Siberia. For some reasons, he had to leave Siberia and come home. And so my wife and I are now praying that God would send missionary to Estonia. One night, my phone rings. I hadn't talked to Mike Smith in two years. He calls me on the phone. He said, hey, preacher. He said, I don't know why, but God told me to call you and tell you that my wife and I have surrendered to go to Estonia. <laughs> I said, it's my fault. <laughs> he just said, whatever, amen. <laughs> and I told him the story. And so it works, amen. And so take time to pray. And uh, I'll tell you what, folks, I'll take some time through this week and tell you about uh, you all pray and help and are involved in the Heirloom Seed Project. We just had the first Royal Seed Summit. We have the Heirloom Seed Summit, which is for the teenagers. And then we just had the first Royal Seed Summit for the 19 to 20 something year old single adults? Yes, sir. Ah, God showed up in a place. Amen. I mean, here's, here's what one, one young lady's parents said. said. She came home and said, communion is special. It's holy at the church. Said ordination is a very special time. She said, I felt like that for four days. How about that? Amen. She said it was such a special time. And God did amazing things. And we'll tell you, and we're making plans for the third one. Good. I just haven't figured out what we're going to call it, amen. <laughs> but there is a third one coming for married couples of ministry kids. And boy, oh boy. I was in Florida in March, and then I'll get to preach it. I was in Florida in March, and I was talking to this young man. He said, my dad was a mission, is a missionary in Peru. And I said, okay. And he said, I came home from Peru, got a, you know, didn't feel like he was called to preach, got an education, got a job, met a young lady, and they got married. And I looked at her, and I said, so how's that going? She said, you got a couple hours? <laughs> she said, there's something wrong with this guy. And we started to talk. The only problem is she didn't understand him. Number one, he grew up in the ministry all his life. Number two, he grew up in Peru. He thinks like a Peruvian, not an American. And we got them like that all over America, folks. And so pray. I'll tell you more about it. You know it's the burden on my heart, but I got to get to Proverbs because the preacher said it had to be done by 10 o'clock. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, some of you look at me like I'm, you're kidding. I'm not kidding. Proverbs chapter number one. When I got into Proverbs, I'm, I made the statement to myself. I said, God, I... I believe you can preach missions out of every book in the Bible. And he said, you're right. So here you go. Proverbs chapter 1. He said, the Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel. Now notice what he says. To know wisdom and instruction. To perceive the words of understanding. Then he said, to receive the instruction of wisdom. And justice and judgment and equity. And to give subtlety to the simple and to the young men knowledge and discretion. And then he said, a wise man will hear and will increase the learning. And a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsel. To understand a proverb and the interpretation, the words of the wise and their dark sayings. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. 
My son, hear the instruction of thy father, and forsake not the law of thy mother, for they shall be an ornament of grace unto thy head, and chains about thy neck. And so he introduces to us the thought of wisdom. How necessary, necessary wisdom is. Now, I want you to put your hand right there, and I want you to look at a couple of verses. We'll come back here. Go to James chapter number 1. Go to James chapter number 1. Wisdom. I tell you what, folks, if our world needs anything today, it needs wisdom. Amen? Amen. And wisdom comes, first of all, he said, for the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. You, the, the reason people act the way they do, you say, man, they got no sense. They don't have any wisdom. Amen. Wisdom is the ability to understand the facts and the truth and then use the facts and the truth to make the right decisions. And our world is lacking wisdom because they do not fear God. When I saw the picture of a preacher proudly display, displaying his Pride Month t-shirt that he had on, that says God loves everybody. Yes, He does. Amen. But He hates the sin. Lack of wisdom. Lack of wisdom. James chapter 1. What's He say in verse number 5? If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. So, we need to understand wisdom. Now, look at one other verse, because here's the key verse. Ephesians chapter number 3. Ephesians chapter number 3. You say, why was this so important to missions and to what we're talking about? You go to Ephesians chapter 3, and then we're going back to Proverbs chapter 1. But in Ephesians chapter 3, Paul is instructing the church at Ephesus. He's telling them uh, what needs to be done in their lives. And he says here in Ephesians chapter number 3, and begin reading in verse number 9. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. Now you know what he's talking about, don't you? Amen. When he talks about the mystery of God. The mystery of God. What is a mystery? A mystery is something people don't understand. Amen. But when... He's talking about the mystery of God. He's talking about what God before the foundation of the world had already determined what was going to have to happen. And as that was the fact that Jesus Christ would have to die for the sins of the world. Amen. Yes. And he had it all planned out. He had it all worked out. And God had to just, I can't even talk to him, established. And the world doesn't understand that. It's a mystery to them. It's a mystery to them how God can come in, save somebody that's lost, save somebody that's a drug addict or a drunk, somebody that's, uh, that has an immoral life. He can save that soul, transform their lives, and they become Christians. They become children of God. Their life changed. Their, their marriage has changed. Their, their whole outlook changed. And the world looks at that and says, I don't understand that. That's a mystery to them. And Paul said that in verse number 9, to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. What brings us together? Amen? Yep. I mean, you, 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 I'm from West Virginia, amen? Uh, that's all right. Some people around here are born there too, amen? You just need to go back where you belong, but anyhow. <laughs> but no, Amen. It's been amazing, you know, uh, you root for the Buckeyes and some people root for the Wolverines and some people root for the Mountaineers, amen. And God can put us all in the same room and we can fellowship together and enjoy each other and encourage each other and unite our hearts in the, the cause of Christ. That's the fellowship of the mystery, amen. But look at this next verse. Here's what got me started. He said in verse 10, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. Huh? It's the church's job to show the world to the principalities and the powers of this world, the manifold wisdom of God. Yep. So wisdom's important. 
So go back to Proverbs chapter 1. I'm trying to get the foundation. i got to get it in gear. I'm not going to get done. Amen. <laughs> but you've heard that before, haven't you? Amen. <laughs> You'll find in Proverbs chapter 1, you can divide this chapter after verse number, uh, verse number 9 into three sections. You're going to find the state of the world in verses 10 through 19. Then you're going to find the sounding of the message in verse number 20 through 23. Then in verse number 24 through verse 31, you find the sentence of the rejecter. Now watch this as it progresses. Beginning in verse 10, you see the state of the world or the lost. He said in verse 10, my son, if sinners entice thee, consent Thou not. If they say, come, well, come with us, let us lay in wait for blood. Let us lurk privately for the innocent without cause. Hey, does that verse not ring to the headlines of the United States of America today, man? Hey, who in the world uh, would conceive such things that we have seen happen in our nation where men walk into buildings with loaded weapons and shoot innocent children? They've planned it. They've connived it. They've put it in their mind. What happens? The verse tells you before that, my son, if sinners... We've got to understand that the state of the world has been and always will be that people are sinners by nature. You say, how do they do these things? They're sinners. Now watch. He goes on. I I get stuck. Amen. He, He says in verse number 12, let us swallow them up alive as a grave and whole as those that go down into the pit. We shall find all precious substance. We shall fill our houses with spoil. Huh? What is spoil? It's something you took from somebody else. Hmm? I'm not going to get into some of this. And he says in verse number uh, 14, Cast in thy lot among us, let us all have one purse. My son, walk not thou in the way with them. Refrain thy foot from their path. For their feet run to evil and make make haste to shed blood. Surely in vain the net is spread in the sight of any bird. And they lay wait for their own blood. They lurk privately for their own lives. So are the ways of everyone that is greedy of gain, which taketh away the life of the owners thereof. Hey folks, you have a beginning to get a description and an insight to the world you and I live in today. You say, preacher, wickedness is abounding. Yes, it's abounding. You know why wickedness abounds? Because there is nobody doing what God said to do, and we'll get to in a minute, and that is giving the world what wisdom is. Amen. Yeah. Hey, listen, I, I, I remember when I went to school, I didn't go to a Christian school. That, there wasn't one when I went, to, I went to school. And we went to the school, but you go to the school and you get up every morning at school, put your hand over your heart, say the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. Somebody would pray. Preachers would come by and, and, and have Bible studies. Every year that I can remember growing up, they had a baccalaureate service where you went to all the seniors graduating from high school, went to a certain church, and somebody preached to them and gave them the gospel of Jesus Christ. He said, Preacher, what are you trying to say? In years past, there was this outcry of wisdom in the streets, and that's what per- that protected us and stymied. Hello? Yeah. The openness of sin. Huh? Wow. I remember going to church when I was, you know, six or seven years old, and, and we, they didn't have junior church. They didn't have nursery. I ain't never met a baby I couldn't out-preach. <laughs> Amen. People say, hold that baby in the service to the cry. I've never been able to, I can, I can shout him down. Amen. <laughs> Bother me. I mean, we sit there, one, two, three of us boys, mom and dad. You get to carry on. Dad reach over, pop you in the back of the head. The preacher said, amen. Everything was good, amen. (laughs) What do we got now? Well, preacher, I'd like to come to your church, but what do you have for the kids? And do you have junior church? And do you have Pastor Pryor? Do you have this? 
I'm not saying there's anything wrong with all that, but we've taken them out from underneath the preaching of the Word of God. Why do people act the way they do? Read your Bible, for out of the heart proceedeth murderings and envy, strife, fornication, adultery, wickedness. All matters of wickedness come out of the heart. But here's our problem. Now listen to me. Here's our problem. We have become so good at condemning the sinners. Hmm? We're to condemn the sin, not the sinner. Why do they do that? Why do they act that way? They're sinners. Why do they go out and drink? Why do they go out and do this? Why do they have no morals? They're sinners. The sin of their life and the devil and the prince of the power of the air has made it so appealing and so, uh, so attracting to them. They're, they're caught up in it. But before we get too, uh, uh, too high and mighty about ourselves, we were once sinners. Amen. In fact, I'm still a sinner saved by grace. Amen. The only difference between me and the man walking down the street out there is I know Jesus Christ, May the 20th this year. I celebrated 50 years of being saved. I love it, amen. Amen. He changed my life. But we become so... You know, Jesus, when all the publicans and the Pharisees got mad at Jesus because he, what, he ate with sinners. Can I ask you one question, man? Do you have one friend that's lost without Jesus Christ? Hmm. I'm too good to run around with those people. I'm not talking about going and doing what they do. Huh? When I pastored, I probably said this here before, but I, I, it just comes in my mind every time I think about it. I pastored. We took a young lady to camp. Boy, she got it fired up. She got a hold of God. God got a hold of her. She went back. She was a very, very good softball player. She shows up softball practice the first time, and this guy that's the softball coach is doing something, and he cussed. And she went over, and she said, you know what? If you come to church and get saved, you quit that. <laughs> he went, Okay. <laughs> And she went back. A little bit while later, he did it again. She walked over and said, I told you. <laughs> and this went on for like two weeks. He shows up to church one Sunday morning. He said, told me who he was. He said, I'm so-and-so softball coach. I come to see what she's talking about, amen. And he walked down the aisle that morning and got saved, amen. Yeah. Hey, folks, people act the way they do because they are sinners. And we need to preach against the sin. We've gotten past that in America today. Amen. We don't want to get up and say that it's wrong to drink alcohol. We don't want to get up and say that it's wrong to take drugs. We don't want to get up and say that this sodomite lifestyle is against the Word of God. We don't want to get up and say that this transgender movement that's this sweeping our nation is contrary to the Word of God and God condemns it. We don't want to get up and say it. Amen. Back to the matter I've been told I shouldn't say it. Because of those military chaplains. I had a guy looked at me one day and he said, you're a rather inspiring preacher. Major General so-and-so. He said, and I enjoyed it. I'm an old-fashioned Christian. It's great. I said, well, good. He said, but you're going to get your chaplains in trouble. You know, I told him that one day and they said, preacher, get us in trouble. We need to preach on sin. Yes, sir. This modely coddling, telling everybody it's going to be all right. It's a bunch of junk, amen? I want to go to church, somebody look me in the eye and tell me if I'm wrong, that I need to get right, and the sin that I'm involved is a sin, and I need to get it right, and look at me and peel my face off, and, and, and love me and put it back on, amen? But the first situation, the state of the world has never changed. Okay? Now, but here's the key. And this is where I may get stuck. Look at the next phrase. All right? Proverbs chapter 1 in verse number 20. He said, Wisdom crieth 
without. She uttereth her voice in the streets. She crieth in the chief places of concourse. In the openings of the gate, in the city, she uttereth her words, saying, How long, you simple ones, will you love simplicity? And the scorners delight in their scorning, and fools hate knowledge. Turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you, and I will make known my words unto you. Wisdom crieth without. The world is in a state. Hey, listen, I wish I had time to show you a a document I read the other day about the response of our government to this transgender issue. And it is just sickening. But the answer. Is wisdom. And notice what he said. Wisdom crieth. In the pew of the church. Wisdom crieth across the pulpit. No, wisdom crieth without. She uttereth her voice in the streets. If the world is going to change, and missions is the challenge to change the world, we must take what God has given us And get off the blessed assurance of our pews. And get out into the street corners and into the highways and hedges. And proclaim the wisdom of God. He said, by the church shall be known the manifold wisdom of God. The church's job, the church's assignment is to take what you got in here and go out there with it. And here's the thing. We're the biggest bunch of hypocrites in all the world. You say, what do you mean? Well, bless God, come Sunday, I'm filling up my faith promise card, and I'm going to pay that missionary to go to the other side of the world and tell them about Jesus Christ. Yeah. Well, what are you doing? Right. The epitome of hypocrisy, Brother Black, is for me to pay you to go tell the world about Jesus Christ when I won't open my back mouth and tell somebody else about Jesus Christ. Do you have wisdom? Are you saved? Do you know the Lord? Then our job is to go into the, as Jesus sent his disciples, he said, go into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in. I I, I got a feeling that when Jesus stood that day on the shore of that that water and began to teach and, and, and speak to those people, they probably thought, what in the world? But He began to give them wisdom. He began to give them knowledge. He began to give them the truth of the Word of God. It's our job to get the truth, not here, not just get it here, sit on it, enjoy it, talk about how great it is to have a great church that encourages us and challenges us, but it's here we get it. There we take it. Huh? Look in Proverbs chapter 8. Look in Proverbs chapter 8. Boy, got kind of quiet around here tonight. Preacher said they had 20 people after soul winning. Let's see how many people's in this room. Hmm? Proverbs chapter 8 he says in verse 1 does not wisdom cry and understanding put forth her voice look in Proverbs 9 verse number 3 I love this verse he said she Proverbs 9 she has sent forth her maidens she crieth upon the highest places of the city Doesn't sound like a bunch of Christians hiding in the corner somewhere. Hmm. We have two missionaries we work with that are in the Ukraine right now. You want to talk about one of the most scary phone calls I ever got in my life? It was back there in February. I get a phone call from a young man and his wife, three precious little children. That's right, isn't it? Three. I guess there's so many kids running around all points, I can't keep track of how many we got. Amen. And, and he said, I got one question for you, preacher. I said, what? He said, do we stay or do we go? 
The city that they were working in was called, is called Harkov. If you look at a map of Russia and, and the Ukraine and you see Belgrade, Russia, and you see Harkov, Harkov is the most western city or eastern city of the Ukraine, and Belgrade is the, one of those cities right on the border of the Ukraine. The first place they came across the border was into Harkov. He said, Preacher, they're coming. They're not 30 miles from my house. Do I go or do I stay? Now I have to admit to you that as a father and a grandfather, I said, get your kids out of there. Amen? He said, but what about the people that we're telling about Jesus Christ? What does that say to them? That we want them to stay and endure the, 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 the onslaught, and we run for safety. But they did. They moved clear to the other side of the country, right on the Hungarian-Polish-Romanian border. But you know how God is? I love how God does, amen. He calls you one day. He goes, preacher, you were right. He said, we're here, and boy, God is doing something. I said, what's he doing? He said, I got out. I walked out of the motel room we're staying in until we can find another place to stay. I'm walking down the hallway. I look up. Here comes a man that I'd witnessed to in Harcroft. He had fled the battle to, ended up in the same motel, in the same place. He said, he looked at me. He said, I think, preacher, I need to listen. You got time. There's going to be hard situations. His mother and father-in-law in the same situation. They're working together at this point in time. He, he, he's, they're there. He said, preacher, what do we do? It's never easy. Hello? But wisdom crieth without. I would guarantee you there have been more Bibles, more tracts, distributed in the country of the Ukraine in the last four months than it probably was in the last four or five years. In fact, there was a picture, I don't know if you saw it on CNN News. I had myself a Baptocostal fit, amen. CNN News is trying to televise and show the people fleeing from the Ukraine. So they got this picture of these people going through this line in this one place to get out of the country. And this little, this little child is standing there reading something. And when you zoom into it, it is a copy of the Chick track, This Is Your Life. And they're saying it, showing it right on CNN News. And I laughed and shouted and said, God's got a sense of humor. Amen. <laughs> Wisdom cried on CNN. Man, first time in their life. You say, Preacher, what are you trying to say? I'm trying to say you the state of the world is they're sinners. The solution is the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Right. But we've got to get out there. Hmm? Are there 50 people that need Jesus Christ sitting in this room tonight? No. But I bet there's 50 people live within a mile of your house that needs Jesus Christ. The church has become too good at setting still. Isaiah, look at Isaiah chapter 58. I'm just, I'm just trying to give you my heart tonight. Set the, set the thought for the rest of this week. Isaiah 58. Come back tomorrow. It gets a lot easier. <laughs> it really doesn't, but I thought it'd make you feel better about it. Amen. <laughs> Proverbs, or Isaiah 58. Here's what God said through Isaiah. In Isaiah 58, he said, Cry aloud, verse number one. Cry aloud, spare not. Lift up thy voice like a trumpet and show my people their transgressions and the house of Jacob their sins. Cry aloud. Is that somebody that walks up and goes, well, I ought to talk to that person, but you know, I don't know really whether I can or not. No. See, because we don't see people as sinners that are lost without Jesus Christ, we're not pressed with the urgency of telling them. 
Well, that guy there, he's a rough looking character. Then go tell him. I got a good friend that has a, has a Harley Davidson motorcycle up in, in Alaska. I said, how do you use that thing? He said, man, I love it. He said, I got a sign on the front of that thing. It says, Semper Fi, real men love Jesus. <laughs> and he said, I just right up in the middle of anything I can find. A group of guys riding motorcycles. Yeah, I just right up in the middle of them. He said, man, the guy was in the Marine Corps in Vietnam. He could, he. He killed people for a living, I think, in Vietnam. <laughs> Nobody's going to ask him anything, amen, or argue with him, amen. He just, I just walk up there and say, hey, let me tell you about Jesus. Where's that boldness at? Because we don't see him as sinners. All we see is the sin. When we see them as sinners then we're going to want to give them the wisdom of God. Now watch, I'm going to, this is where it really ties together. Listen to what Jesus said in John chapter 7, verse 37. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirsts, let him come unto me and drink. John chapter 7, verse 37. I think about this. It says in the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and was a silent witness. Hmm? Isn't Jesus the one that stood and said, you scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites? Yet Jesus is the one they brought the woman taken in adultery to, and he didn't look at her and said, You adulterer, get out of here. Right. He looked at her and said, Your sins are forgiven, go and sin no more. Huh? See the difference? How about Jesus sitting at the well in John chapter 4? Can you imagine that woman coming to an independent Baptist church in America? <laughs> Well, tell me about it. Well, I've been married five times. And the man I got now I'm not married to. Unclean. <laughs> Unclean. What did Jesus say? He said, you're going, there's coming a day when you're going to worship in this mountain. And he revealed himself to her. Huh? He didn't condemn the sinner because of their sin. Right. Now look what happens here. Back in Proverbs chapter 1. I'll give you my heart. This next few verses breaks my heart. Preacher, you're a better Bible scholar than I am, so when I'm done, you can straighten it out. He says in verse 24, because I have called and ye refused. I've stretched out my hand and no man regarded. But you have said it not all my counsel and would none of my reproof. I will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. When your fear cometh as desolation, your destruction cometh as a whirlwind. When distress and anguish cometh upon you, then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. For they have hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. There's coming a day when those that we've warned, Brother Shell, and they've laughed in our faces, they're going to finally think, hey, it's time to, I, I need to get there. And God's going to say, Sorry. 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 Huh? Wow. Think about that. You say, but preacher, I tell them they don't listen. And they mock me and they make fun of me. Well, one day God's going to say, that's it. Hmm? 
I think the Bible talks about a reprobate mind. I believe I met a guy with that at that place the other day. And he'll come crying. And God will say, nope. Because you didn't listen to wisdom. You mocked wisdom. You mocked the reproof. Can I tell you the difference in the day and age we live in now? Years ago, I still pastored, so that's 30 years ago. I was to schedule to do a wedding. Got a call from that family, and they said, can you come to our house? I walked in that room. I knew something wasn't right. And he said, preacher, sit down. And he, I sat down, this young lady and the guy she was going to marry sitting there. He looked at her. He said, look at me. She looked up. He said, whatever he tells you to do, you do it. And you understand me right now. You hear me? She said, yes, sir. I said, what's the problem? I'd already figured it out. She's pregnant. There was such shame. Hello? Yeah. That same high school, I read an article the other day that they graduated nine young ladies with babies in the nursery. 30 years later, it's not a problem. What's the problem? Us. We quit crying in the streets. We quit crying in the streets. Oh, we're enjoying our church. We're enjoying the fellowship. We're enjoying the good music. We're enjoying our preacher. He can preach. Boy, that's God. Hallelujah. That's great. Then go do something about it. Get up and go to the streets and cry in the streets. Go to people's houses and cry at their doorsteps. One of the most moving things I ever saw in my life, preaching one night, and a 90-something-year-old man is standing there. He'd come to the service that night. His son standing beside of him. And he, we got to the invitation, and his son got up and got down on his knees beside his dad, and he said, Dad, please, please get saved. Yeah. The old man broke. came and got saved. But I've seen the same situation in a man turn and walk out the back door. And I believe God said, okay, I will laugh when your fear cometh. Huh? The state of the world has always been the same. They're sinners. The sentence upon the rejectors is always the same. They're going to hell. The gap between is our responsibility to cry in the streets. We have the wisdom of God. Amen. We have the wisdom that passeth all understanding, the truth of the Word of God. We need to take it to the streets. We need to take it to the streets. We need to take it to the highways and byways. You say, preacher, is that right? Let me, just, let me just read you a couple more verses. Isaiah 65, he said, Therefore will I number you to the sword, and ye shall all bow down to the slaughter, because when I called, you did not answer. When I spake, you did not hear. Jeremiah 7, And now because ye have done all these works, saith the Lord, I speak unto you, spake unto you, rising up early and speaking, but ye heard not, and I called, but you answered not. Then he comes to Luke chapter 20, and he says this, and, and he beheld them and said, What is this then that is written? The stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner. Jesus said, You reject me? It's all over. Hmm? Missions. The state of the world has never changed. The sentence of those that reject Jesus Christ has never changed. Hello? But the problem between the two is we have ceased to cry in the streets. To cry without. 
I'll test your Christianity and I'm done. Did you ever drive down the street, see some guy stand on the street corner with a scripture sign and laugh at him? He's making a fool of himself. Like he's crying on the street corner. You pass a car that's got a big bumper sticker with a verse on it. Now look at them crazy fanatics. Really? I got inducted by fire. I didn't know any different. I came go to Bible college. The first thing, first guy I met was Brother Sam Gipp, and he said, "Hey, you ever been street preaching?" I said, "No." Come on. Thursday night, we went down the middle of Mass on High. Seventeen teenagers preaching on a street corner, handing out tracts. Hey, man, this is great. So the next Saturday, he said, come on, let's go to Canton, Ohio. We went to Canton, Ohio. They, uh, down in town, Canton, Ohio, they used to, I don't know if they're still there or not, they used to have these big raised flower pots, about four foot off the ground. They, they would stand on that pot till they wore the, the flowers out of it, amen. So they finally just went and cut a, a three-quarter inch piece of plywood that fit right on top of that thing. And they were down there standing on that thing preaching. And the bus pulls up across the street. The bus stop was right across the street. And this guy pulls up in that bus, looks at them guys preaching. He guns that bus, trying to drown them out. He gunned it four or five times and it died. Boom. <laughs> and he sat there for 30 minutes waiting for somebody to come and get him out of that mess. Listen to preacher after preacher after preacher. Amen. We've quit that. We've quit going to the parades and handing out tracts. We've quit going to the street corners talking to people. We've quit knocking on doors. We just said, let them come to us. But that's not how it works. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you tonight. I pray, God, you'd help us. Wisdom crieth in the streets. Speak to our lives as only you can. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.